My name is Peter Gagan. This is about work in the going Postgres 12 release. Um, it's also an overview of high-level thoughts on the design of the B-Tree code in Postgres. Um, I'm, I work for Crunchy Data. I'm a PostgreSQL major contributor and committer. And I have a strong interest in indexing in general. And it's, uh, there's also, I also kind of tend to refer to uh, the wider academic literature and research literature, and you'll see some of that during the talk today. Um, there will be opportunity to ask questions throughout. Um, the code in question is pretty complicated. Um, I'm trying to help people to develop their own intuitions, their own mental models around it, in order to make it at least no more complicated than it inherently needs to be. Um, so I'm trying to uh, describe it in the most general terms to make it a little simpler to approach from a high level. Uh, there is often difficulty with terminology in this area um, for all kinds of reasons. So I'm going to start with the big picture. Um, the main point of the design, uh, the, w the way things work at the basic level, this is, of course, a hacker-orientated talk, so I, I assume that uh, these basics are probably reasonably well understood by everyone here. This is kind of a, just a quick refresher. So in general, uh, the, the big idea with B-trees is that we use page splits to add new pages. That's the only way new pages are added. We'll see a bit more of that in a minute. Um, there is recursive growth. That is, new levels are only added to the tree uh, in response to um, the root page being split. Uh, this happens at logarithmic intervals. So the tree structure itself is typically very, very wide and very, very short. So in, in, a, in that sense, the tree is not really a tree at all. That's kind of a bit misleading. Um, it all, in general, the, the code in Postgres consists of just a few localized atomic operations. Um, we can do an awful lot with, with just these few localized atomic operations. Another key concept is the concept of the key space. We start out with everything and divide it up. We never extend to a new range of values. We, so we start with everything and we, sp and we have page splits in order to determine where some subset of that range, uh, we delineate um, pages in which some subset of the original range belong after the split. Uh, when we split the rightmost page, we're splitting between um, the leftmost. Uh, so, so, the, so when we're splitting the rightmost page, the existing upper bound lattice is, is positive infinity. Uh, and therefore, the new right page will also have that upper bound. The original page that we're split, that is the left side of the split, will have um, a new upper bound, which is somewhat spread in the middle of where we split. Uh, so in general, we always have one particular page that any possible new tuple should go on, at least in Postgres 12, where um, some ambiguity about where things belong, if they're fully equal, was resolved. So there's a place for everything, and only one place for everything. We must protect the structure of the tree uh, using low-level um, reader-writer locks, LW locks, sometimes called latches in the literature. Um, we need to prevent the structure from becoming consistent. NB tree itself uses something called the Lehman Yao algorithm. Um, it has introduces a right sibling pointer and high key to each page. These are also sometimes called implementations that use this are sometimes called B-link tree as well. This is an image from uh, a paper, not the Lehman and Yale paper, in fact, but another one. And it illustrates uh, how page splits occur. There are two atomic operations involved. So um, the split is, uh, consists of an initial uh, split, the operation that allocates a new um, page here. And then uh, afterwards, there is an insertion of a new downlink here into the parent, complete the split, 
at the end of second atomic operation. Now, before that happens, there's the right sibling, in a sense, has the left or original uh, page as a kind of foster parent. Uh, it allows us to um, simplify things in a sense because um, we we are. This allows us to make the second half of, of the uh, split, that is the, the insertion of the downlink, very similar to any other insertion into any page. I don't want to get uh, spend too much time on this. I did start a bit late. Uh, so, and his work gets interesting. Uh, we we must move right to recover. So we have this high key in each page, which uh, is an explicit um, record indicating an upper bound of values on the page in general. So we check the high key at, at any point that we descend to a page. It might have been that there was a concurrent page split. It might have been that we uh, are we missed the downlink that was subsequently inserted in the parent. There's two observable states here. We we see that when we arrive to the child because that the high key will be potentially, although not always, uh, less than um, the value that we are inserting or searching for or what have you. So we're recovering from the race condition. We're accepting the possibility of the race condition and detecting and recovering from it rather than uh, proactively preventing it from happening as was the case with earlier designs, um, pessimistic designs essentially. So this is more optimistic. Um, so checking the high key um, is, it's a way of basically confirming what we saw the first in the first phase of the descent. So there's a kind of a symmetry here, which I think is worth pointing out directly. Uh, when we do a page split, we split the page and we, in the first phase, in the second phase, we insert the downlink. The downlink has a copy of the key that was, th that's the new high key for the left side. Meanwhile, anyone that's descending the page first observes, you know, they do binary search to find where they need to, to go down. And from there, uh, they, in, when they reach the child uh, itself, of course, they'll check the high key. So they, these two things mirror each other. Um, that's uh, quite uh, quite important. Uh, so any any quick questions on that? Is that already? Hopefully, I handled that reasonably succinctly. It's, uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll move on then. I'm going to talk about um, invariance and their importance and and how things work in Postgres 12. This is an image that's a representation of, I guess you could say it's a representation of Lehman Yao B trees. You could also say it's representative of Postgres 12 B trees. Now, it isn't literally true that uh, Postgres 12 B trees look like this. I'll show a more realistic example uh, later on. However, this is representative of their original design and not, uh, it's not representative of the way things were previously. Um, in fact, what we did in Postgres 12 was to make heap PID uh, a tiebreaker column and that serves to make everything unique. Here, you have to assume, take it as granted that these keys, these green keys here are unique. That's just something I'm asking you to assume. You also see here that these, this high key here happens to match. So you could say that that's a duplicate of that, but that's simply describing what belongs on this page. So in fact, it's not. Um, now, this particular uh, depiction differs somewhat from how it might have been represented to you in the past in other talks. Uh, I've chosen to um, represent it in a way that makes more sense at a higher level. I think clarifies the design. So you, you probably can't see that. If you want to, you can, by the way, you can, you can see my slides here. That's going to be displayed throughout. Uh, so you might want to, if you want to look at that in detail, you might want to look at that URL. So the difference here is the, the brown colored keys are separators. 
the difference between that is the this representation and one you might have seen in the past. This, these are all separator keys. The high key on this level is also Papa, but I have deliberately depicted that the same as all of the other ones as well. Moreover, here we see uh, a minus infinity um, uh, value explicitly. That's actually truncated. Um, and we also see a positive infinity high key here. Ordinarily, we would say we don't have a high key in rightmost pages, but I think it clarifies matters at a high level to say, you know, we do, it's positive infinity. Uh, another thing that I'll point out is, it's actually clear if I go back, the, the negative infinity one here is in, I've had that in, in inverted commas deliberately because it's not true negative infinity as is the case in the root page. Rather, it's negative infinity relative to the subtree on the right whose root is this node here. In, in reality, you could imagine that that could be Papa as well. So you've got high key on the leaf, Papa. The left sibling high key is Papa. The separator in the root is Papa. And finally, the you could say low key for the internal page to the right is also Papa, logically if not physically. Moreover, the entire tree is split in two along this line. Another thing you, you, you may have noticed but probably didn't is this is gray, whereas this one is black. And what I'm trying to represent there is that the relationship here is slightly different to the relationship here. These are cousin pages. They're not true sibling pages. Mostly this distinction doesn't matter. But in some cases it does, such as with page deletion. Now, because keys are now unique in Postgres uh, 12, in general, we can say a lot, quite a bit more than we could previously. Um, this subtree to the left is, in a very real sense, almost like a completely different B tree to this one to the right. They have um, discrete non-overlapping ranges in the key space covered. So we can, in general, I think, reason about them more easily because we can, we can think about it if, in those terms. We can isolate the uh, subtrees more readily. That's kind of abstract, and I'm not going to try to justify that, but I, I'll, I'll say it in passing. OK, I'll move on. There are, as I've said, uh, very, true, very few true special cases. The, um, the NB tree readme tends to emphasize things that are pertinent when you're looking at the page level, important because you know, most individual pieces of code are, are, are thinking of things in those terms. So it makes sense that it describes things in those terms. But often, this is not the most useful way of, of thinking about it. I think it clarifies things to make some of the simplifying assumptions that I've already described to you. Um, it also bears saying that Lim and Yao themselves, um, in my opinion, just explain things in a way that's odd. It's not a particularly well-written paper, in my estimation. Uh, but don't take my word for it. This is a quote from the Lannan and Sasha paper, which is the basis of our own uh, page deletion algorithm, where they point out, I think quite politely, uh, that the assumption that Li and Yao make about atomic reads and the lack of any requirement for read locks is not reasonable in, in any realistic uh, system. So I just think it's, very, it's a very strange way that they chose to explain themselves. It's inexplicable to me. Like, why would you explain, why would you introduce something that's better than the state of the art without describing it in the same terms as the state of the art? So they go on to say that we'll, that's what we'll do instead. Um, so I, again, this is just an example of, if you read that paper, you, you can expect to be confused. It doesn't mean it's not worth reading. It just means that you, you really need to be verifying it against multiple uh, different uh, sources of truth. Um, th there are some references, by the way, if you want to uh, download my slides, there's URLs that you can refer to and possibly get um, a bit more on that in your own time. And of course, there's this thing about terminology as well. Because we're using the page model, and because we need the index tuple C structure to work in a variety of contexts, we introduced this other terminology. This was originally introduced for include indexes, um, but it could have been introduced previously to that. That was just, that's just a historic note. So pivot tuples contain either separators 
or downlinks, um, or both. Usually both, sometimes just one, sometimes just the other. Um, Liam and Yao describe them as being independent things, more or less, but we kind of don't because we're talking about the index tuple representation as opposed to the abstract idea of a, of a separator. So it, it's tricky in a way that I guess it doesn't really need to be. Um, so hopefully these diagrams I've created uh, help to clarify some of that. You have non-pivot tuples as well. Those are the ones you saw in green. Those point to the heap. Um, they don't describe the key space. They don't describe what values belong where. Rather, they are the actual keys. These are the vast majority of keys altogether. Um, so I'm sort of, I'm, I'm framing, I'm framing it that way because it acknowledges the truth of both situations. Um, and it's just, it's worth being aware of the situation even if you're not aware of the details. Uh, now, in general, we describe the structure of the tree in terms of invariance, things that must always uh, hold. Obviously, you have to have everything on, on, uh, in the logical order dictated by the operator class of the type you're indexing. However, the relationship between the separator keys and the real keys, the green ones versus the brown ones, that actually can be quite loose. They, after all, are only, only, only need to separate the key space. Uh, nothing more. They don't actually need to be a direct copy of any key at any given time at all. Not necessary. This makes them a good target for uh, prefix compression because you already have a low key in a sense. Um, so you could already, it's already possible to, to use that uh, for compression because it's just there already. Uh, now we haven't done that yet, but it's something that we perhaps will consider in a, in a future release. The fact that Lee and Yao explain things the way they do, which is what you saw, where they had a direct copy of what was at least at one point the, the last left tuple, obviously it's the simplest way of explaining it, but it's not the only way it can work. If you look at it in the most general terms, if you think about it in terms of invariance, you'll see, well, it's actually, they require quite a, bot, quite a bit less than that, and we perhaps ought to take full advantage for performance reasons. Um, so it seems to me that any good design in this area tends to not only anticipate future work, but to actually actively enable it as a, almost just as a, an indirect, unintended consequence. I can't really justify that. Uh, it just seems to work that way, or has worked that way in a number of cases so far. Um, we're now able to reason about subtrees as independent units. There was this sort of awkward ambiguity before because dupes could be stored in any particular order, but now we have, we're not, now we're, in general, not going to be confused about what belongs where because there are rules that um, remove any question about as to what, as to where any possible tuple belongs. Now I'm going to get on to the main part of the talk, which is talking about the um, the work in 12 in detail. Um, as I said, there's now a place for everything, and everything will be in its place. Um, we are, as I mentioned, using the heaptid as a kind of tiebreaker. So that means that, um, of course, everything is unique because the heaptid always was unique itself for obvious reasons, I think. We'll also need this for retail index tuple deletion. Um, it's generally thought likely that at some point we'll re-architect vacuum so that it, rather than doing a, the um, bulk deletion taking the bulk deletion approach that it currently takes, it may in some instances go do an index lookup based on values in the heap, including, of course, the heap tid as a tiebreaker column. I can re reliably relocate anything in the index from uh, the heap now that that ambiguous case no longer exists. So in principle, you could have a design that zapped things in the index in, a, in an eager fashion, operated reliably, not opportunistically, and um, potentially save us a bunch of I.O. I believe that the people working on Z-Heap are quite interested in this capability, although I'm told it's a long ways off as yet. Um, so I assume that at some point someone will take full advantage of this. Exactly, how that, exactly what that would look like, I can't say, because the integration of this with a mechanism such as Vacuum is independently a much larger project. But I don't want to spend too long on that because it is basically incidental to the actual benefits we're getting in Postgres 12. 
So inserts must specify a heap tit, of course, because that's required to, in any index tuple, it's, that's newly inserted. And it's also required to determine the final place that the tuple belongs in the event of there being any dupes. And we can imagine a deletion implementation which is very similar to the current approach to insertion. That will just be a, s a small piece of work. As I mentioned, the integration itself would be far larger and far more complicated than that. Now, getting to the concrete benefit that we'll see today. Um, so previously, there was a behavior uh, called getting tired, where in the event of having many duplicates, duplicates that spanned many pages, um, there'd be, we'd have a choice to make as to where to, to put it. We would invariably descend initially to the left of all the dupes, and then we'd go on the leaf, on the leaf level, we'd, we'd walk. Hopefully, we'd find a place to put it pretty quickly. But if we didn't, we'd continue. And in general, we could continue for an awful long time. Getting tired refers to uh, some, an event that occurs randomly to prevent erratic behavior. So if we keep going, keep going, keep going, it, even though in principle there could well be free space, we'll eventually give up and split a page that we stop on simply because we're not willing to wait that long. We have to consider latency. That's not acceptable. So you could very well have a case where <coughs> even though in principle the free space is available to use, it is never actually used if you just have enough duplicates. The details are kind of complicated, but that's the basics of it. So now, as, as an automatic consequence of treating heap to as just another column, this no longer occurs. This can make, it's not very difficult to show that this makes indexes that have a lot of duplicates about 16% smaller. That's not even a vanity stat. I could come up with it if I wanted to. That's just the simplest sort of case. If you have a lot of range deletions and stuff like that, you could easily see a, uh, a bigger decrease in, in bloating than that. That's without any vacuuming, without any updates, without any deletes, just simple inserts. Um, also, GitLab seemed to have been affected by uh, bloating on non-unique indexes with lots of dupes. There's a URL here to a blog post. I strongly suspect that that particular um, edge case has basically been addressed by this. And were they to, uh, re were they to try to try, try the same workload on Postgres 12, they'd find the problem had gone away. So um, if you want to drill down on how it affects particular indexes, that's actually a good resource to go to. This is a realistic small Postgres feature. Uh, now, of course, this, yes? Uh, the extent to which you benefit from that particular facet of the 12 work will, there are other facets in addition to this that are actually somewhat unrelated that I will get to. So basically, yes, uh, but you'll see another thing that is totally independent that is interesting as well, where we avoid bloat now. Uh, so again here, so scans here will descend between the separators, the downlinks, uh, this is minus infinity, this is 367. Now, heap tit is represented in blue here. In order to avoid storing heap tids in internal pages where they're not really needed, we're able to truncate sometimes. So this has a value of negative infinity here for the heap tid. We cannot cheat when it comes to treating the heap tid as just another column. We really have to fully embrace that idea. This is a like sort of PG branch account style, primary key, um, you know, integers fairly, fairly uh, sort of 16 bytes a piece um, with the default leaf fill factor. So this is totally realistic in, in every detail, um, unlike the first example. Uh, now, there's a couple of things that are worth pointing out here, uh, I think. Um, so we have truncation, of course, to, which is how these are able to be negative infinity. I'll explain what that is in detail in a moment. Suffix truncation. Um, it's also notable that unlike the original example, this isn't equal to either the last left or the first right. Previously, it, we, we saw keys that were generally equal to the last left for Lehman Yao. This is closer to the first right. It's not equal to it, of course, because the actual value here is negative infinity. This is a real value. Of course, the whole idea of having negative infinity values in your indexing them, that, that's just a 
a, a sentinel value, it's a, it's a fiction. It doesn't matter though. Uh, so this, it looks basically like the, uh, this one here, not this one here. Um, now this, again, eliminates ambiguity. Suppose we descend the tree looking for uh, the value seven, three, two. Um, then we will, we'll go down, we'll do, we'll do binary search in the root, we'll go down here and we'll find it. We won't go to the, because we have this here and it, it's not equal, we know that there's nothing to find here, so we'll just give up. We'll only have to, have to access one leaf page. Likewise, if we access 733, which can only be over here, we, can, we know to go over here. So we're not doing I.O. when there's any ambiguity. Now, maybe this doesn't matter that much. It would, I, I could probably construct an example where it actually does matter. Whether or not it does is ultimately not the point I'm trying to make, though. The point I'm trying to make is there's no need for any ambiguity, so there isn't any. Um, that's why you'll only have to go to one leaf page. There are cases, of course, if you had a, a loads of duplicates, you probably couldn't tr truncate. It probably wouldn't be a minus infinity, and then you would have to visit two leaf pages. But that shouldn't happen that often. Now, in order to explain what suffix truncation is, let me just go back to, this is another sort of classic paper from, this one's from 1977. So suffix truncation generally applies to strings, not to whole columns. Right now, the implementation in 12 only truncates away whole suffix columns. This includes the uh, implementation level heap column, but it also includes others. This is perhaps the easiest way of explaining it, show, showing what it is in its classic form. So this example here shows when you're splitting two pages, um, you can choose. So you're splitting here between Cookie Monster and Ernie. You can put any value there in the middle as your high key that will separate the two. That's the only thing that matters. So for example, you could put D in there even though there isn't even a value in the index that begins with D. It's irrelevant. That, that's true. Uh, now, we don't actually have this mechanism, this exact mechanism implemented as yet. Didn't get around to that, but it would be relatively simple to implement it on top of what's already there. In fact, I most likely will. So um, this is a actually fairly early um, work in the history of feed trees. Um, so, We can imagine also what it would look like applied to the earlier example. Here again, we see the same thing, except of course the separators are smaller. Now, when we go to split the page, we could in principle truncate the, the key on the left or the right to whatever happened to suit. The smallest one that would, would go in there, presumably. Uh, and that might even have the effect of making the tree one level lower because of course we could avoid that root split altogether. I'm just giving you that further example to reinforce the general point. It's not actually that likely that that would happen in realistic cases because uh, we only add levels at logarithmic intervals and therefore you, you might have to make the separators like 50 times smaller to reliably make the, the tree, uh, you know, wood level lower. That, so that's not really usually the most important metric it's one that people tend to put a lot of emphasis on because it's just, you know, it's, it's good for discussing the worst case, but it's not particularly relevant. But I'm just, like I said, reinforcing the idea by showing that. Now there's also the question of where to split the page, and this is very important. In fact, I would say this is the most complicated uh, piece of mechanism that went into the 12 work, the one we spent the most time discussing. We're not obligated to split the page uh, in any particular pace. Traditionally, and even still, the number one criteria was uh, having an even amount of free space on either side of the split. However, it doesn't have to be precisely even. Since it also dictates what we can use as our new separator, regardless of the scheme we actually use for that, um, we are, we'd be well advised to be a little bit careful about that to consider as a secondary factor how effective suffix truncation will in fact be. Um, the algorithm, as I've mentioned, now gives 
some emphasis second, as a secondary consideration to suffix truncation, actually some other things as well that I'm going to get to that are sort of independent. We can make a very small adjustment and get a, a quite a large benefit potentially. So it's not like space, even, having an even share of space on either side is still by far the biggest consideration, but it's not everything. This is a, an image from a paper that is much more recent and I think very influential on in my work. It's, um, it's by Gutz Grefa. It's called Modern B Tree Techniques. And here he's talking about classic suffix truncation. This is 2011, so it's much, much more recent. And he points out here that this represents the approximate center of the page. That is to say, the split point at which we can expect an even amount of space on either side. It would traditionally be considered optimal by our algorithm. However, based on heuristics, we could say that this range here is an acceptable range, a split interval where we're reasonably happy with the uh, balanced free space and we're therefore willing to choose amongst these split points um, to make suffix truncation as effective as possible. So if we, if we choose, say, between um, Miller, Doris, and Smith, Eric, then we only have to put S as our new separator. And likewise, we could do the same here. It's only a small difference in this instance anyway, so it's well worth it. The details are based on heuristics. You get the basic idea here, though. Um, so we have to take a holistic view of things. We have to consider um, not only the balance of free space and not only even suffix truncation, we have to consider how things tend to develop over time when you have a succession of splits. Uh, we have to consider also that we want to split to the right when we have very many duplicates. We want to detect that and do so in order to uh, pack the pages as tight as possible. So it's almost a bit like a rightmost page split, even though it isn't the rightmost page. It's merely a page that's full of duplicates. Otherwise, we're going to waste half the space on the page. Uh, after all, heap tid is just another column now, so it would restrict. We're restricted when we're not going to. We're, we're not capable of doing suffix truncation. We're restricted in um, by that, so we don't want. We don't want that. Uh, we don't want it to be. Un we don't want the choice of where, which page we we can insert future duplicates on to be unreasonably constrained. Now, getting on to the thing I was mentioned earlier, a totally independent piece of work, really, that also reduces index bloat by rather a lot, especially with TPCC. Um, so I'm, I call this the split after new tuple optimization. Uh, this strongly re re uh, rewards my work as it happens. Now, you could debate how important this actually is, I suppose, if you wanted to. You could say, well, OK, that makes all the indexes in TPCC taken together 35 40% smaller. That seems pretty good, but is that really representative of a workload that I'm going to have? The answer is I don't know, but I don't think it necessarily matters what the answer is. I prefer to think of this as optimizing what was previously a pathological worst case, and we'll see why in a minute. So anyway, the TPCC ordering system is more or less a circular buffer or queue where we continually um, batch insert um, new orders and then later on we delete the orders um, following simulated sort of post-processing in the business rule that the app, that the, be that the benchmark uh, simulates. So there's like, all of these, all of the, many, many of the indexes, actually most of the indexes follow the same basic pattern where there are groupings like such as order ID and then within each grouping, you have line items, and those are those are um, inserted in monotonically increasing auto incrementing order. Um, so it's kind of a it, it's kind of a, like a traditional uh, serial primary key, but not quite. So what do we do about that? Well, here's actually a worked example, which is by far the easiest way of explaining it. Imagine here we have. Uh, we're going to insert additional tuples from the order, order number one, colored here in magenta. Now somebody else inserted this previously. We don't know who, it doesn't really matter. No high key will be shown in these examples. There will also no, be no heap tid. 
just to be clear, those are deliberately omitted because they don't serve the example. This is not a rightmost page. Actually, it is right now, but it won't be in a minute. You can say, uh, so we won't be consistently splitting um, to the right because we're going to be inserting these ones. We're gonna, we're gonna, we'll see that in a minute. So this is already 100% full. Um, you have to assume for the sake of the example that uh, we can fit four tuples on a page. Obviously, that's totally unrealistic. Those dimensions are way off, but it would really be the order of two to 300, but that wouldn't work as an example. So I'm just making some simplifying assumptions. So, okay, we start with what was on the last page. That's what you see here, the last slide, I mean. So we're going to compare the 50-50 uh, page split algorithm to the optimized one. Now, initially, they're both uh, having inserted 4, 5, 6, that is 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6. We're, we have two page splits in each case, and it's not too different. There's the same absolute number of pages so far. However, what I will point out is that we've already actually done the split after new tuple part of this whole sequence. That is the here we see the two one tuple is on its own page already, whereas it's mixed together here. Continuing, we insert some more things, another three things, seven, eight, nine. Here, you can you start to see what's happening. Um, we fill up, we had, so that was our, went from that to that. So we filled up the, the the free space we had here, and we split that in the manner of a rightmost page split. There are heuristics that detect these conditions. And now we've opened up, we're about to take the lead. We have have all this free space exactly where we need it. Whereas over here, it's distributed. And now, again, we'll insert three more things and the overall pattern that will manifest itself continually is seen. 10, 11, 12, we fill up this free space. We get zero page splits here, but we get another two here. I think you can see where this ends. Keep going, and you will waste 50% of the space with the old algorithm, which you'll waste no space with the new algorithm. That, uh, yes? Yes. And the same solution would likely work. The heuristics are well, they're heuristics, right? Yeah. Exactly, yes. There's to, and, it, and logging and, and so on and so forth. Yes, there's all kinds of secondary costs here. Page bits are really expensive, so if we can reduce them, that, that's great. Now, in reality, it wouldn't actually be 100% full on the right. We'd apply leaf page fill factor. It would be fully analogous to a traditional rightmost page split. So it's using leaf fill factor even here, even though it's not the rightmost page. Uh, so you might think, oh, well, this is a, you know a kind of a neat optimization. Um, but as I, as I sort of started on earlier, I prefer to think of it as fixing a pathological case. Let me just point out, wasting 50% of the space here, oops, sorry. This is not like average, this is below average. If we had entirely random insertions, the traditional guarantee is we have space utilization about 65 to 70%. We're doing quite a lot worse than that. So in fact, it's fixing a problem more than it's optimizing something that already worked reasonably well. Um, there have been cases where this was reported and people were very confused as to why. I will grant you that that was where people running a TPCC benchmark. Um, but I have independently observed this in real world Postgres databases without, you know, when I was doing some of my testing, I sought um, a lot of test data and I happened to come across cases where this occurred organically. I don't think you need too much imagination to see how it could happen. In fact, um, one of the organic cases was in the, both of the PG depend indexes. It wasn't quite 40% because there are a lot of duplicates in, the, in that case, but both the PG depend indexes were 20, 25% smaller after the regression tests were run. So, you know, I think that it's fair to say that it happens enough. Okay, any questions? Because I'm, I'm better, only about five minutes left, so I, I, I better uh, try to get going with this section. Any, any questions at all? No? Okay. 
Um, so a bit of prognostication now. Uh, so one idea that's very speculative that I thought I might pursue at some point is key normalization. This idea is, again, described in modern B-tree techniques. The idea is that you create a new high key, a new separator. All new separators are created by leaf page. That, so you could potentially go even further than I have to date and make a representation of that that ultimately can be compared to a key, another key using string compare. So you have a, uh, a conditioned binary key um, and that uh, will behave equivalently to the original uh, would with the authoritative comparator using only a string compare. So everything is now a binary string uh, and you can from there push it even further. You can do prefix compression based on this. Classic suffix truncation could also work that way. And you could go even further than that and you could implement abbreviated keys in internal pages potentially. Uh, now I go back and forth on that technique. I sometimes think, well, that would be an awful lot of trouble, wouldn't it? Because of course you have a problem of you know, collated text and the dependency on that 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 specifically creates. So there are certainly issues with that. Even assuming we never do it, I think it's useful to be aware of that technique because I think it kind of clarifies the design um, of uh, B trees in general. Like that's all they are, they're separators. So in principle, you can represent them any way that will correctly separate um, leaf pages. Um, anything that'll do that will work. Uh, so in order to have the abbreviated keys, which are these sort of high entropy uh, leading bytes of a, a normalized key in this instance, um, in order to have them have sufficient entropy, you probably would also have to apply prefix compression. So all of these techniques are complementary. They are worth more than the sum of their parts. Uh, you'd really have to do them all at once almost in order to get any benefit. So this is very speculative. I tend to think I'll end up implementing suffix truncation without any of this at all. I mean, traditional suffix truncation, where you are creating a new datum that compares, uh, that's used in when you're descending the tree. So it would be, it would be a very short string usually, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be a normalized key most likely. I think it's too too much. The, the downsides are too uh, considerable for it to be worth it. But I point out anyway. Again, modern B-tree techniques, uh, if you have any interest in this stuff at all, I, I would recommend you read this one first. It's a survey paper. Um, it, as I've mentioned, quite influential in my work, uh, very cogently written, far better, far more comprehensive, comprehensive and comprehensible than any of the other stuff I mentioned. Um, I'm also starting to think, because we, we have all these new requirements these days, pluggable storage and stuff like that, I'm starting to suspect that we we ought to bite the bullet and uh, have index tuple headers with offsets rather than require that when we're comparing a, an index tuple, we, um, we basically uh, have to uh, incrementally go through each of the columns. Uh, and I say this because I think what we want to do with pluggable storage is to accommodate uh, a table uh, row identifier that isn't a heap tiv, that isn't fixed size, that could, for example, be a text string. Uh, and that will ha probably have to work like any other column in that it'll have to have a PG attribute entry and all, all that goes with that. But at the same time, we want to be able to get to that quickly in cases where we, um, we, we we're only interested in the first column, say, we don't want to go through all the others just to get to the thing that we're looking up. So one of the advantages of this approach is that it provides a cheap way of jumping to the end, which we would need in this new world where we, we have <laughs> identifiers that are not just TIDs, which is the case with the heap and the new uh, Z heap design, but something even more, uh, you know, heap something, something that's like a user defined type, something that you might see in a clustered index or something like that. I also think it, this, this could help with skip scans uh, and prefix truncation and dynamic prefix truncation all these techniques for um, either omitting a prefix or for skipping a prefix on the basis of it being known to be redundant in that part, in that subtree. Um, we could even, because of the fact that the, sub the subtrees contain um, non-overlapping ranges, we can reason about 
what will be redundant to our scan. Uh, so the advantage here with uh, the, head, the tuple offsets is we, we, we'd still be able to avo avoid uh, comparing them with the current tuple format, but um, that we'd still have to go through them as such, which might be kind of painful and best avoided. So this is a huge undertaking. I have no illusions about that, but uh, I kind of feel like it might be time for that. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to work on that stuff, but I, it's just a thought I thought I'd introduce here. So in conclusion, uh, when you're reading the B-tree source code, it pays to consult an awful lot of different sources uh, with the view to trying to get an initial understanding and then trying to verify your understanding elsewhere because this stuff is, uh, it, it is intrinsically complicated, but it's also, it's also much more complicated than it needs to be at the same time. So it's, I think it's helpful to say, hey, if you're confused, it's not necessarily your fault. Um, I certainly was when I uh, first got started with this years ago. Um, it also, I think it's really helpful to make simplifying assumptions that don't really lose very much of the important detail when you're discussing the high level design of stuff. And I'm trying to get some of that across here today. Also, I recommend visualizing real indexes using tools like Contrib Page Inspect when you're undertaking a project like this. I leaned heavily on those techniques throughout uh, the work. And I know others have too. For example, when Heike Nikangos was working on the 9.4 improvements to page splits, was a, that, was, that work was strictly about reliability. Even then, he uh, had tooling to visualize real B trees. So I think um, there's something to, to that. I think if you, if you, I think you can gain an awful lot of insight by like looking, figuring out a way of efficiently examining their structure and seeing what actually happens and checking how that matches what, with what you think ought to happen. And I think that's all I got. Any more questions? No? Yes? Jim. Sure. Yes. Yes. Well, yes, you'd always, so, so the important thing, and I, I'm gonna say it again, don't be under any illusions that the, the TID is just another column. It really is. There are maybe some ways in which th that isn't true that are kind of incidental, like it doesn't have a PG attribute entry, but internally it is just another column. So. In most cases, in the vast majority of cases, suffix truncation is at least sufficiently effective that its representation within separators is negative infinity. It is, however, still represented in all cases. So yes, um, you, could have, it could, you could have a constraint on within a, a large group of duplicates, what can go where, um, which could theoretically have downsides, but all things considered in practice, it's more than worth it. Yes, so does that answer your question? Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Right. I, th that's exactly what we see in uh, the posting lists in Jin. They too are sorted and therefore easily compressed. I think that's an important point. Yeah. Um, so we could totally do that now. Yes? Maybe. Yeah. What, I, what, I should, what I probably ought to do is uh, try to just do, do a draft implementation, just to prototype it, just to see how, like, if it's way faster. Well, maybe that's a, that, that's a discussion then. But I'm not going to undertake it. It ought to be pretty damn fast in order for it to be uh, worth all the complexity. I, I think that there's considerable risks with, with having text using normalized keys if there's a whole bunch of dependencies. So needless to say, I'm not too keen to undertake that unless I really see a benefit. But I'm not sure really. It's, it's, this is, that, that aspect of it is very speculative, so I can't say for sure. Anyone else have a question? Okay, I guess not. 
I think I'm done. Thank you.